you start to realize that it's the combination of all of these different functions that needs to be there in order for uh, your body's handling of nutrient loads to be done in the most kind of effective way possible. What the heck is GLP-1? Yes, uh, GLP-1, uh, it's all the craze now, right? Um, it's an incretin hormone. So that's a fancy way of saying it's a gut hormone that helps your body deal with uh, the nutrient load that your body, uh, you know, takes in. And one of the primary ways it does that is it promotes uh, insulin secretion. Um, so this is super important uh, because then it enables your body to get rid of the sugar from the bloodstream and move it to where it's needed, which is to power up your cells. And so this is something, this, this hormone is, is something that we would normally produce and should normally produce. Uh, and are there, and we now know that this hormone, among other things, is used for weight loss. It was not the original intention of uh, synthesizing this hormone. Uh, and I live in the LA area, and I think uh, every human being seems to be on this drug uh, for mostly bad reasons. But uh, vanity would be the number one. A lot of people uh, who use this drug noticed that one of the major side effects is they are not hungry, period. And sometimes they are so not hungry, they walk around nauseated, and that apparently is a good thing. So why is what we produce? maybe better than these pharmacologic solutions. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would just, yeah, separate entirely, right? Like a pharmacological solution, you should use it if you've got pharmacological reasons, you know, for, for that. So uh, definitely kind of using it outside of that is not really a good idea because the levels of concentrations and, and so on that, that those are intended for uh, are just a different scale. Um, and what we're talking about here, kind of your body's natural production of it, uh, is more about getting your system uh, more into natural balance and having your system's appropriate response when you eat a meal. Uh, so it's more akin to, you know, the benefits of um, having a well-balanced meal with the right nutrients, right? There's that aspect of it is kind of well understood by people, but the microbiome aspect is kind of works hand in hand. So you can have the well-balanced nutritious meal, but if your microbiome isn't uh, predisposed to handle it appropriately, you're not gonna be optimal on that front. You're not gonna be balanced. Um, but yeah, I, G GLP-1, the natural uh, levels of it, it helps, as I said, on, on uh, insulin secretion, but also, to your point on um, satiety. So, you know, and, and at for the natural levels, it just will help you get comfortable more quickly. And so you don't, you know, ingest more than you need, right? Uh, and another uh, area that it helps with is actually on slowing down gastric emptying. And what that means is that as opposed to having all of the contents of your stomach kind of, you know, dumped into the rest of your system all in one shot, which results in these high spikes, it does it in a more metered way. And so if all of that is working as intended, um, then your meals will not be kind of this rocky affair, kind of roller coaster. Uh, it will end up being much more, um, much smoother, uh, resulting in kind of better, better energy uh, and, and, and not having the lows or the highs. So we, you know, we've talked about ecomancia a lot and how, that particular bug is, to me, it's always been the holy grail. It's one of the, I, I think, the cornerstone species of, of health. And I've been you know, fascinated with it and butyrate production and promoting butyrate producing species. But how is this different? Are they tied together or you got to have both. Why did you guys say, hey, GLP-1 is something else we should be looking at? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and this actually, I mean, ties, I think, for, you know, with what the theme for, for our discussion today, which is the way that these systems uh, work together, 
Right, so GLP-1 is the signaling done by your cells. Uh, but then, you know, acromantia and these butyrate producers, as we talked about, you know, last time, as your listeners probably know about, they produce these very helpful postbiotics, things like these short-chain fatty acids like butyrate. Uh, but we'll talk about other, other things as well. Um, and what they do is that they uh, help your cells function better. So butyrate, for example, is an energy source for the uh, cells in your gut lining. Um, and then they, they then, the, in turn, signal your cells to do their signaling. So the, the, the two systems kind of work hand in hand. So it's not kind of one or the other, but rather the two things together uh, lead to the optimal outcomes. You know, again, the, the advertisements have been aimed at diabetics. So a lot of these pharmaceutical drugs were aimed at diabetics, and the side effects were noted. Our listeners who are not a diabetic or who aren't pre-diabetic, why would that be of interest to you and me to, you know, have better insulin control, have less cravings, et cetera? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so th this is why uh, it's important to think about this kind of more as the the natural system and how it's intended. Uh, and, uh, you know, every meal can end up being, you know, kind of a much sharper, almost joy ride versus a smoother transition, right? And if uh, your meals are well balanced and if your microbiome is tuned up, um, then you'll kind of avoid, I mean, my analogy is you don't want to be on, you know, kind of the jolting seesaw, right? Where you crash at the bottom and you like come up off your seat, uh, at the top. Uh, you want things to be, um, kind of you, this time and range is something that people talk about, especially those, uh, who use continuous glucose monitors and things like that. So you don't want to be uh, very often either too low or too high, but in the band, as, as often as possible. And if you do that, that helps your overall health. Uh, basically, shocks to the system are just not good overall, and they don't put you in a good in a good space. Where's the research now on acromancia, for example, in facilitating this? Yeah, so that's been one of the areas that was uh, really interesting. Uh, a couple years ago, there was this paper that came out in Nature Microbiology from a Korean lab that delved into acromantia's role uh, with, with the signaling with your body's GLP-1. Um, so they had a preclinical model, and they showed that in that model, um, acromantia was protective of um, minimizing weight gain and reducing these sugar spikes. Uh, and they delved in even more than that and, and actually showed that there is a specific protein that viable metabolically active acromantia produces, and they termed it P9. And that this P9, uh, in turn, uh, interacted with these specialized cells in your gut, these L cells, uh, and induced them to produce GLP-1. These cells are the ones that are the gatekeepers uh, for GLP-1 production. Um, and so that was very exciting. And we, uh, here at Pendulum, uh, reproduced you know, their in vitro model and demonstrated that in uh, this model of L cells that we, when we put in ac the acromantia postbiotics from our strain under manufacturing conditions, we were also able to replicate that. Um, so that was super exciting. So I think there is a direct link now with acromantia on helping to maintain kind of your healthy response to food intake. You know, we talked about before, you, you have a product called glucose control that it combines multiple strains including acromancia and uterine. Uh, and you had shown in a clinical study that this had actually lowered hemoglobin A1C. Um, have, have there been any, have people measured in a clinical study, not a preclinical study, GLP-1 levels in, in humans on acromancia? Are you doing that? That's something that's, yeah, definitely in the works, because uh, obviously that's that's sort of the holy grail. It's one thing to have things in a in vitro model uh, or even in a preclinical uh, animal model, uh, but it's obviously a different thing to be able to see it directly in, in people. Um, one of the ways that you can get at it is through, you know, measuring, as we said, kind of with CGM, uh, response to sugar spike. So that's 
you know, further down the line, it doesn't give you directly to the GLP-1, like how was it done? Uh, but it's helpful at least to to tell us kind of where to dig. But that's definitely something we we want to follow up with. All right. So now you got everybody interested. Oh, gee, uh, I want more GLP-1. Uh, let's talk about, are there other ways to increase our GLP-1? Yeah. So it turns out there is... Um, Another approach, which uh, you know, turned out from that, as we dug into our clinical study uh, and looked at kind of all of the postbiotic stuff that was produced there that could be helpful, we realized that there was this secondary bile acid, um, UDCA, or so the oxycholic acid, uh, that was higher in the group that responded the most metabolically, so the ones that had the, the drop in A1C and the lower uh, sugar spikes. Um, and this was very interesting. We hadn't considered that uh, angle, that kind of bile acid uh, approach. Uh, but then we looked into the literature, and it turns out that, in fact, you know, 10 years ago, people had been seeing the effects of UDCA, and there they had, did measure in humans the increase in GLP-1 uh, upon taking UDCA, as well as, of course, the, the overall metabolic benefits. Interestingly enough, I've been recommending uh, Tudka, which uh, to a lot of my patients, uh, based on Chinese medicine, Chinese medicine believed, and they were obviously right, that bare bile was a real health time. And interestingly, um, bears to this day uh, in Japan and China are hunted for their gallbladder. And they care less about the rest of the bear, but they want the bear bile in the, in the gallbladder, and it, it, it gets large amounts of money. And you go, where did the heck that come from? And it turns out UDCA, your so is bear. And this is where all this came from. So I think it's amazing that you know all of this stuff that's been known for thousands of years, actually, we can now put a clinical measurement on and go, oh, that, that's how that works. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think this is this has been the exciting uh, area of, of the microbiome, uh, you know, explaining a number of things that um, we hadn't understood before and then revealing, you know, new paths for us. Um, and, and, you know, the, the bile acid side of it is, yet again, this, this, this kind of two systems working together, right? You create the primary bile acid, but it's your microbiome that creates the, the secondary version. So, again, you know, if you, you have one and not the other, you're not going to be in the spot that you, you need to be. My new book will be coming out in January called Gut Check, and a, a lot of the purpose of the book in, in one of the chapters is it takes two and you know the the part that the microbiome plays as you know and i know we're, we're every day we learn some you know important interaction that we would have never imagined was as, was as complex an ecosystem that you know, none of us would have guessed except for the microbiome project and yeah it's just it, and, but the chinese knew two centuries ago and so, so there, and there's a study right out of UCLA looking at Utka's role in metabolic syndrome in, in uh, elderly patients, right? Yeah, so I, th I believe you're referring to um, the one where there was about 90 geriatric patients that were being studied. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one. yeah. Uh, yeah, and and uh, they were studying it for for liver disease, so um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it had been known for a bit of time that UDCA helps on that front. Um, and so they were measuring uh, liver enzymes and using ultrasound. And they did find uh, that, in fact, uh, UDCA helped on that front. But then they were uh, you know, pleasantly surprised to find out that it also helped on glycemic control and insulin sensitivity. Uh, so that you know, kind of started uh, people thinking that UDCA might have you know, uh, more than just uh, liver health benefits. Um, and in fact, I, I, maybe I'll even mention okay, there was a in that same year there was a much smaller kind of pilot study of about seven people uh, that was in healthy volunteers, and this is the one that I was referring to earlier that uh, where they gave UDCA and then they measured GLP one to show that in fact one of the ways that it was working is by increasing GLP one uh, levels, and that 
in conjunction, it also resulted in lower glucose spikes. So it was a small study, but it was sort of like got to the mechanism. Now, let me back up for people who, who don't know. We have an, an epidemic of fatty liver disease in this country. Uh, we sometimes call it NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or FLA, a fatty liver disease, and um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it, you, there's also a beautiful study that I've referenced. You can give fructose to rats and give them fatty liver disease really easily, folks. And you've also, there's also a study that shows that reverses that fatty liver disease in, in rats, right? That's right. That's right. And actually, it's in some senses quite similar to that study I was re referred to with acromancia that was done, that preclinical study. So, right, they, they induced this metabolic syndrome in, in the rats through giving them uh, fructose. And then with UDCA showed that it helped with insulin resistance and reduced uh, oxidative stress. And it also dropped uric acid. That's right. So, I mean, I think it, you're seeing kind of a lot of these benefits from these postbiotics. Uh, and it's sort of, you start to realize that it's the combination of all of these different functions that needs to be there in order for uh, your body's handling of nutrient loads to be done in the most kind of effective way possible. I'm going to pause there for a second because you and I throw around the word postbiotic like uh, you know, cocktail party discussion. If you've read my books, uh, you know what postbiotics are, but if you're just joining us, it's confusing. Uh, most people now know uh, probiotics, so-called friendly bacteria, and acromancia is a probiotic. Then people are beginning to understand prebiotics, which most people categorize as fiber, but if you listen to me and even pendulum, you know that one of the exciting findings is polyphenols are actually prebiotics that our gut microbiome just thinks is delicious. So, so what? Well, your probiotics eat the prebiotics and they then produce postbiotics, which are the active compounds that simplistically comes from the digestion of prebiotics by probiotics. Sorry to be so confusing. I think if we had to do it all over again, we would have never used these terms, but we're stuck with them. So postbiotics are, are, are where the action gets done. And for instance, short chain fatty acids are postbiotics. Gasotransmitters, when you fart, believe it or not, those are postbiotic signaling molecules. Uh, sorry to do that, but um, you know we, we can go down nerd bill, and, but we got to keep everybody. So postbiotics are really important. Absolutely, yeah, no, and definitely the definitions are, are super important, and otherwise everybody gets lost in the woods. Um, absolutely, yeah, exactly right. Uh, postbiotics are really important, and as you're pointing out, it's about kind of building the right ecosystem. Right, so the, the prebiotics, it kind of gets the right substrates, gets the right nutrients there, builds, you know, give, gives you the right kind of plants that you want, right, the probiotics, and then they give you the fruits and vegetables that are helpful for your body, that are the, actually the, the business end, as, as, uh, as I like to say, that, that kind of uh, moves the needle on your health. All right, so what, what does all this mean for our listeners? Uh, how do they get their UDCA levels up and get their GLP-1 levels up? Yeah, so actually one of our uh, best-selling products, Metabolic Daily, has all of these uh, key strains. So it's a formulation that consists of five strains. Uh, it includes acromancia, uh, but it also includes three butyrate producers. Um, and then it rounds it out with a bifido uh, that helps kind of break down a number of these complex substrates. So it's, it's got kind of the full gamut uh, that's able to tackle the problem from a number of different angles. So it's it's intended to help with this, you know, natural balancing for metabolic effectiveness. And folks, uh, I take metabolic daily. And I'm not afraid to tell you that. Again, in gut check, one of the things that I think is 
really important for us all to realize is you have to have, it's almost like an assembly line. And one bacteria species has to be able to make a byproduct of its eating something that a second bacteria species needs to complete its job. And in fact, there is a chain of bacteria species. And we may have, well, we now know that there are you know, bacteria that are five chains down the line. And if you don't have the first four bacteria, that guy can't produce the postbiotic that we really want. So it's people like Pendulum who have said, okay, you know, acromancy is great. It's really important. It's a keystone species, but it's a facilitator because it's giving these other guys the things that you really want, like butyrate. And believe me, butyrate is you really want it. So, I, and I think this is great. And I, you know, I congratulate you guys for, you know, combining these in what is good science. You just didn't dump. Here's here's 20 different strains, and there's a lot of them, and we have no idea what they do. But here they are, and then you should swallow them. No, exactly. I mean, it, it was, uh, in some senses, kind of following in the footsteps of what normally would be kind of the development of a pharma thing, where you think through the the functions that you really need, uh, you know, what are those key ingredients, and put those all together and test test it all the way through. Um, but yeah, no, to, to your point, it's important that you think about it in that ecosystem way uh, in general, because otherwise it's it's hard sometimes to get some of these results that require, you know, a number of things to be layered in at the same time. There's a lot of talk, even in research circles, and I, I write about this in the new book, dead bacteria do tell tales. That dead bacteria have utility. Uh, on the other hand, live bacteria have potentially and probably more you took and can you help us through that why why don't i just take a bunch of dead stuff um uh, there are some papers that suggest that dead bacteria do some pretty cool things um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think they do and you probably do too but yeah. why living why did you guys work so hard to get the living bacteria yeah, um, yeah and, I, and I totally agree. I mean, I think that uh, there there is uh, science around some of the things that are, for example, just directly in the cell walls of the, the strains uh, that can um, be helpful. Uh, and in some senses, because of the ease of it, it can be, you know, maybe you can pack more in. But you miss some of the the what's produced that actually requires it to be metabolically active. So the reason why we um, kind of went down the much harder road is that we understood that there's going to be a whole slew of things that um, these strains needed to produce on the spot. And that part of the, the magic, if you will, is that they're in the right place, responding to the environment and producing things in the right ratios. Uh, and that's crucial right that and i think we talked about it a little bit the last time that you know some people even say like well why don't you just give butyrate right? you know that butyrate is good just give butyrate uh and it's not that simple because butyrate uh is just not going to make it to the right spot right it's sort of throwing cash on the highway like everything can use it and it's not going to be in this in the spot that it needs to to do the signaling and uh that, that's needed so it's along those lines um i mean one of the analogies i always use is like the strain is like a really smart robot, right? That is in the right spot and interacting appropriately and responding to the environment. Uh, and that's very diff difficult to replicate uh, by just kind of launching something over the fence and just hoping it happens to land in the right spot at the right concentration and, and does the right thing. Um, and then there's just the general ecosystem argument so beyond what the strains themselves produce, they kind of create the environment, as you're pointing out, for other strains that you want to grow to kind of flourish as well. So it's it's sort of like you create a nice, lovely garden, and then suddenly you have hummingbirds. Like, you know, you wouldn't that that wouldn't have happened if you only 
kind of uh, had like one or two ingredients out there. You you need kind of the full system to be there to get some of the, the broader benefits. Yeah, we, we talked about Acromancia and your other products. Why would you go for metabolic daily versus one of your Acromancia products? Uh, does somebody need both? Is one better for somebody? You know, what, why did you come up with this problem? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, and one that we get all the time. So uh, as we touched on, Metabolic Daily has a, a broader set of strains. So it really tackles the metabolic question from a number of angles, right? So it's got the butyrate producers. It's got butyricum that produces that uh, bare bile that we just talked about. Uh, and it has acromancy as well. So it produces the P9 and is a, a keystone uh, strain. Um, so kind of in conjunction, all of them work together really well uh, for metabolic-related uh, issues and, and kind of keeping you on that um, you know, time and range type of thing balanced. Um, acromancia, on the other hand, is very concentrated on acromancia. So it's for those that want to really, you know, supercharge and replenish that keystone strain. And it is an important strain. So it's, it is one of the ones that, um, helps on a number of fronts, but specifically for gut health, right? It helps with the lining, right? It's one of the few strains that's allowed by your body to be directly in the lining. Uh, and studies have shown that it helps increase the thickness of that and helps kind of the barrier integrity of your gut. So if that's what you're shooting for, then I would go for acromancia directly. I guess you just answered my question. If, if you can only afford one, uh, is it, you got a preference? I, as I said, like it, it depends on what you're what you're going for. I mean, I, I myself go for the, the broader set because I feel like I'm in, in good shape now on, on acromancia and I just need... Uh, kind of a maintenance dose of it, and I need some of the other the other strains to kind of round it out. Since you brought that up, I get that question all the time. Uh, okay, I took Acromancia for three months uh, every day, and I bet you I got plenty down there, and why should I even bother taking any more? I have seeded my gut. What say you? That's a really great question. Uh, and we actually studied this directly. So in our clinical study, we had a washout period, right, where we stopped giving uh, any of the strains for a month. So the intervention period was three months uh, daily uh, and then a washout of a month. And it turned out that uh, only one in five or less had any any strain remaining after the one month. Now, it's important to note that we did not give any uh, – uh, advice to change diet or to change your habit because this was part of the study. It was like to see the effect of the the formulation. Um, but this is the sort of thing that has to be done kind of in concert. So if you want engraftment and in, in um, these strains to take, it, it is an ecosystem type of question, and and uh, you may need to always give a little bit of dosing in there uh, for, for a while to support it, right? Uh, or to combine it with supporting it with some of these prebiotics and uh, the right kind of nutri uh, you know, nutrition balance. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there aren't any foods that contain acromancia. Yeah, not, not uh, in any sort of significant quantity. So in fact, generally, as you pointed out, it's polyphenols that people have used to help uh, basically to help flourish the the uh, remnants of acromancy that you, you might have. And, you know, if people have read my books and even in the upcoming book, uh, super old people who are thriving have a much more generous uh, population of acromancy than, quote, most people. And that's, I think, one of the reasons we probably ought to be interested in having acromancia around. Um, yeah, I, there was a very distinguished colleague of mine who recently had a video out about all the foods where you can get acromancia. And I just, I just actually cringe because there aren't any. Um, sorry about that, but that's okay. Are there any other probiotic strains, friendly bacteria, 
that support the production of GLP-1 that you guys are looking at? Well, I mean, uh, one of the the reasons why we got into uh, butyrate producers were that they were correlated with uh, its sort of general metabolic health. Uh, and it was thought that maybe they could uh, themselves, it, it, you know, induce GLP-1. That part, I think, is still a little bit up for debate as to whether they do it directly, because it may be that they do it indirectly through kind of synergy with strains like acromancia, because, you know, acromancia and butyrate producers actually work kind of in concert, uh, exchanging molecules and so on. And then there's, as we said, like maybe subsets of butyrate producers like butyricum that have this other quality, like the secondary bile acid. So they may have fallen under the umbrella of, well, butyrate producers help on this front, but it, it may be kind of a more specialized subset of, of those. So we're we're on the lookout for for other ones uh, right now. It's uh, mainly uh, the the UDCA route and uh, Acromancia. Yeah, you guys are always doing something interesting. So you're about to launch an omega three booster. Mm -hmm. what, what do you what? How do you boost omega three? Can you, can well, you fill us in? Yeah, absolutely. So it's actually if it, it follows in the footsteps of the success of the polyphenol booster. Uh, and so where polyphenols have been shown to help boost acromancia levels, uh, omega-3 has been shown to boost levels of butyrate producers. So kind of both of those boosters would work in concert with our strain products, right? And you can kind of uh, bring them in uh, together or maybe as a uh, initi initiating it or uh, afterwards, right? So you can do kind of different combinations and they can help kind of work together with the strains. I think this is very important for people to, to understand. And I, I use the example in my Palm Springs office about probiotics. And I, I call them basically grass seed. And I say, okay, I'm, I'm going to sell you some grass seed. And you come back two months later and you say, you sold me bad grass seed. And I said, why? And they said, well, you know, I, what'd you do with it? Well, you know, I took it out in the desert and put it in the sand. And I said, yeah. And did you water it? No, you didn't tell me to. Uh, did you fertilize it? No, you didn't tell me to. And, and I go, well, wait a minute. What did you expect? And I, I think, you know, you guys and lots of people are beginning to realize that, yeah, it's it's great to swallow some grass seed uh, probiotics, but you got to give them what they want to eat, and you got to fertilize them, and, or they're not going to grow. Is that just a naive way to explain that? No, that's a that's a perfect way to explain it. I mean, I think that's exactly right, and and I think uh, that's such a great analogy because I think it will hit home with people, and they realize like, oh, it's just. It's not enough to just take these strains out of context. Uh, you've got to also uh, water them. You've got to take care of them. You've got to uh, bring other things along for the ride. Uh, bring, you know, bring their friends along for the ride as well. So other other strains that kind of work in concert with them, as well as these prebiotics, are, are super crucial. Yeah, and your omega three point is actually very well taken because there's plenty of literature that shows uh, omega three fats enhance the integrity of the gut wall. Yes. Uh, there's beautiful literature on short chain omega-3 fat, alpha mm -hmm. acid, and actually uh, preventing uh, lipopolysaccharide incursion across the gut wall. And yet what we're probably going to find out is, well, these guys weren't doing it themselves. It was facilitating the species of gut bacteria, which are then, you know, making more mucus or making butyrate. And it wasn't the omega-3 that was the actual thing. It was what these bacteria needed from them to do their job. I think that's exactly that's exactly right. It's it's basically this this overall network. Uh you know, and a good deal of the benefits come about from uh th these indirect effects where they help to grow the right set of uh, strains that can do these functions and can interact then with your cells in the right way. We talk a lot about GLP-1, and it is obviously a hot topic. Uh, are you are you developing with what you know now a GLP-1 product or 
Yes, I mean that that is definitely something uh, that we're uh, looking into, and uh, just like in the in the discussion we just had, it, it you wouldn't be surprised that it will contain acromantia and it will contain butyricum for the bare bile, uh, and it's also going to contain inulin, right? So the fiber, uh, as well as rounding it out with the bifido. Uh, again, to your point of that assembly line, which I really like that analogy. Um, and so, actually, I'd, I'd want to like reach out to your listeners and say, for those of you who may be interested, uh, to please reach out to us at PendulumLife.com because we're thinking of, uh, you know, having a study to see its effects on cravings and other outcomes, uh, as one of the ways to to learn to learn more about it. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. All right. You, you heard it here first. I have a whole section in my new book uh, about the effect on emotions from the microbiome and specifically depression and anxiety. Can you give us your thoughts uh, on where are we with uh, the, you know, the microbiome gut brain connection, particularly in terms of depression? Yeah, no, it's actually, um, I think one of the most exciting fields in the microbiome, right? The gut brain connection. Uh, and, you know, I think it's still uh, early days. So I think there's still a lot uh, to be done there. But now I, I think there, there, there isn't any doubt. I mean, you know, a few years ago, it might have been considered a little crazy to say that, you know, the, the, the connection goes two ways, right? Uh, and uh, that your gut is able to actually influence your mood and um, you know, it can have an effect on anxiety and depression. Uh, but now it's, you know, it's widely accepted. And, and in fact, it, um, the, the, the question now is really understanding the mechanisms and understanding how to harness that knowledge and uh, create, um, you know, interventions and things that can help uh, on that front. Um, so I think it's a very exciting uh, moment for this for this um, specific field in the microbiome. Yeah, I mean, it's even got a, a, it's got an entire you know term now, psychobiotics, and I mean, there's divisions devoted to this now. I wish they hadn't chosen psychobiotic because it sounds kind of psycho, but I think we're stuck with that term now too. So, or and it doesn't mean psychedelics either, but. Uh, but no, I think, you know, Daniel Amen was now, you know, basically said, I think we should really stop talking about mental health as a brain issue. And we really ought to be, you know, talking that, you know, about gut health and its deep connection to what our psyche is doing. No, absolutely. And, you know, uh, out of fear of getting, you know, too philosophical, but, uh, you know, uh, as I've gotten more and more into this field, you really do uh, recognize what you, what you said, which is the centrality of the gut. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because for an organism, the key thing is energy conversion, right? Life is converting energy into, into uh, being able to do all of the kind of life activities. So, it has to be kind of the, the the thing in some sense running the show. Like if things go wrong there, there isn't anything else that's going to happen. So um, interestingly, you know, the brain and, and such uh, is maybe an accessory organ. You know, I've for years now called this thing up here to the second brain and the real brain is down here. And, you know, I've written about it. I, I think because of the incredible gen in the genome of the microbiome, you know, vastly more genes in our microbiome than we have. And they're, they're constantly mutating, they're constantly changing. They're constantly getting new information from viruses. And, and they're doing this you know, constantly. And so I, I think we basically you know, uploaded most of our processing power to this supercomputer that happens to, to live in our gut. And, and that supercomputer Sorry, folks, kind of controls everything that's going to happen to you. Sorry, but Hippocrates knew this 2,500 years ago. That's right. That's yeah, right. He that's a great quote. <laughs> yeah, all disease begins with the gut. Yeah. He called it a green life force energy that wanted people to have perfect health. And he didn't know what that was, but I think you know, 
thanks to your work and others, we're beginning to realize that this green life force energy, maybe we should have called it brown life force energy. But it, yeah, it's it's this it's this most important, you know, tropical rainforest organism, whatever we want to call it, that is this life force energy. No, absolutely. And actually, I mean, I, I actually find it beautiful that the description, uh, you know, of us is really this super organism, right? We are, we are not just the collection of human cells. That's almost boring to think about. It's really this interaction, this deep interaction with all these other species that are all working in concert. And uh, it's an amazing network. Uh, and it's a, it's a complex uh, thing that we're only now starting to, you know, piece little bits and pieces, and and as we do it, I think we're we're beginning to realize, you know, a lot of benefits because not accounting for that was, uh, you know, keep us keeping us in the dark on on some really crucial functions. Yeah, really. You know, up until 2006, uh, we didn't even know these guys existed, um, and in the sequencing now, you know, it gets better and better. We're getting, you know deeper and deeper into the sequences from groups and species and families and yeah. No, that's exactly right. Because it basically it was the advent of sequencing and the av availability of it that enabled us to to see this kind of hidden universe. Because otherwise we were only left with the things that we could culture. Right. Uh, Which uh, wasn't ever very good. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit of a catch twenty two. Like how do you know what the conditions are to culture something that you've never seen? Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have no idea what what substrates it might need, what conditions it would be, and I, I liken it to kind of deep sea travel. Like you know the the the, the type of uh, organisms that live in that environment are just very different than anything that you see uh, everywhere else. So the next episode of the Dr. Gundry podcast is waiting for you now. Interestingly enough. People who have some of the longest life expectancy, the Acciarolis in southern Italy, are small fish eaters, anchovy eaters.